Tonight, on the cusp of summer, big news for travelers. The federal government is set to drop certain vaccine mandates. Also tonight, the loved ones of van attack victims describe the impact of their deaths. It's very difficult to be saying those words in front of him, but it was necessary. Then a Toronto court sentences the man who murdered them. And they're in sky-high demand, but they're leaving in droves. It's no wonder they're leaving because we're undervalued. And I think also related to the pay that we get, right? Canada's crisis in early childhood education. This is The National. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. Andrew is away. We begin tonight with breaking news. CBC News has confirmed a major change is about to be announced to the vaccine mandate when it comes to travel in this country. Ashley Burke is breaking the story for us tonight. So, Ashley, can you take us through what you've learned? Adrian, the federal government is expected to announce tomorrow that it's lifting the vaccine mandate for travelers. For more than seven months, anyone who's unvaccinated has not been able to board a plane or train in Canada. But sources with direct knowledge of this decision say that that vaccine mandate will be lifted, but there will be some conditions so that if there is another variant of concern, the government can put restrictions back in place if needed. The sources also said this applies to all domestic uh, travel on planes and trains, but also outbound planes as well. So, Ashley, this has been a long time coming. Cabinet has been discussing this issue for weeks now. The federal transport minister has said that this mandate was in place to help protect travelers. We also know the government was using this way to try and get more people vaccinated, but there have been growing calls for this mandate to end from protesters, from opposition parties, from the travel industry itself, questioning the effectiveness of this mandate right now uh, because of the new of the variant Omicron. But they also argued that the mandates have already list, lifted across the country and felt that it was time for this one to go too. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister has tested positive for COVID for the second time this year. Justin Trudeau tweeted that he's feeling okay and says he feels okay because he's had his vaccinations. Trudeau returned just days ago from the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. Just four words can still conjure a horrifying scene four years ago, the Toronto van attack. The driver, a man seething with misogyny. Alec Manassian rammed through crowds of people with a speeding van rented for that purpose. It happened on a busy stretch of a famous street. Ten people died right away, murdered. One woman died years later. And countless lives from families, friends, bystanders, and the injured all were shattered. Today, a judge handed down the maximum sentence, life in prison. But that only happened after survivors and loved ones of those who didn't make it were able to tell the court and the killer what his actions did to them as well. Stephen D'Souza has the details. It was the first time loved ones got to face the killer in person. For some, expressing their grief was a chance to heal. It haunts everybody in there. Michelle Kelman was with her friend, Andrea Braddon, when Braddon was struck and killed in the 2018 attack. There was this huge weight that was lifted from my shoulders in saying that, I mean, he's in there today. It's very difficult to be saying those words uh, in front of him. The attack shocked the city and country. Rocco D'Amico spoke of the emptiness without his daughter, Anne Marie. The daily tears my family continues to shed would overflow this courtroom. I long for the day this pain might diminish. Alec Manassian stared ahead, expressionless. He sat there, showed zero emotion, barely looked up at anybody reading an impact statement. Charlene Mackay spoke of the ever-present um, emotional it's, trauma. It's in everything that you do every day. It's always <laughs> present. It's always ready to erupt. Some spoke of nightmares drinking problems, families and relationships falling apart. The court also heard about the painful struggle of Amoresh Tesfamariam, who died after a three-and-a-half-year struggle in hospital. I'm um, happy um, that we have him behind bars. The killer was sentenced to life in prison for all ten first-degree murder counts and Tesfamariam's death. He'll be eligible for parole in 25 years, the maximum allowable after a recent Supreme Court decision 
dismissed the idea of consecutive sentences. At the end of the day, we have to respect the law of the land. Obviously, we all wanted him to uh, not be eligible for parole for much, much longer. Now, they try to move on. But there's still, you know, the next 50 years of healing from this. I hope he rots. As one statement said to the killer directly, you don't deserve mercy. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. There are new and disturbing details today about another senseless attack. 22 people were killed just over two years ago when a Nova Scotia man dressed as an RCMP officer fired guns and burned homes over two days. Kayla Hounsell starts with a paramedic's haunting account. The children who lived here witnessed their parents being murdered. Their friends next door also lost their mom. Eventually, all four children ended up in the back of Melanie Lowe's ambulance. But the kids, like, explained in detail from minute to minute what had happened. The things that they had seen and how their house was on fire and the things that were shot and, you know, people that were laying on the ground outside of their home. And Lowe and her partner didn't even know they were as close to the armed killer as the RCMP officers. I think we were put in a, in a position of danger which we shouldn't have never been put in because we have nothing. We have, no, we have no bulletproof vest, we have no weapons. But one of the people responsible for dispatching paramedics says he had no idea there was a man masquerading as a police officer. The RCMP told his supervisors not to tell him, he says. Their being our primary concern is not putting them in harm's way. Mm -hmm. But again, not knowing where the harm is or what it is becomes a, becomes a challenge. The paramedics said they didn't get the care they needed following the tragedy. There was no offer of time off. There was no mention. It was just expected. So I called peer support and uh, I activated myself. I said I, I'm calling because I'm crying and I really don't know why. So. They agree there has not been adequate training since. We're no more prepared today than we were, you know, going on two and a half years ago. The commission also heard from 911 managers. They testified they used to have 50 dispatchers and call takers. Half of them are no longer working, mostly because of the mass shooting. We realized really quick that the only way we're getting any information is for something else horrific to happen. So every call that came in was worse than the next one. They described how there was no time to take a breath, even when they learned one of their officers had been killed. It just felt like the room, the air went out of the room for about a half a second. And then we just went on uh, like it didn't happen. That's our, our, our job is to protect the members, take care of them. Make sure that they make it home. <laughs> and we, we couldn't that day. The paramedics say they feel a sense of duty to call for changes, but also want people to know sometimes the helpers need help too. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Organizers of a Sikh event in Ottawa say police wrongfully arrested two people from their group in connection with Saturday's lockdown of Parliament Hill. Now, people in that area were told to shelter in place for two hours while police investigated a potential bomb threat that turned out not to be true. Two individuals were arrested, then released with an apology. No charges were laid, and police are investigating. For the second day, a U.S. Congressional Committee held hearings on the January 6th attack at the Capitol. Last Thursday, the focus was on the day itself, and today the focus was on Donald Trump, how he galvanized support for the lie that led to it. We heard how his own campaign and some of his closest advisors told him that he had lost the election fair and square, that claims it was stolen from him were fiction, and how at every turn he rejected that reality working to spread the lie instead. Susan Ormiston has the story. With a laser focus, the January 6th committee shredded Donald Trump's stolen election theory. The Trump campaign legal team knew there was no legitimate argument, fraud, irregularities, and yet President Trump went ahead with his plans for January 6th. I said, Mr. President, there are... Evidence including damning words from his former attorney general debunking the fraud. I told him that the stuff that his people were shoveling out to the public were bull, was bullshit. I mean, that the claims of fraud were bullshit. 
There was no mysterious suitcase in Georgia stuffed with ballots for Biden, nor thousands of dead voters in Pennsylvania. That was absolute rubbish, and it was like playing whack-a-mole because something would come out one day, and then the next day it would be another issue. Multiple people warned Trump there was no proof, including a White House lawyer. What they were proposing, I thought was nuts. You know, the theory was also completely nuts. Thank you. Trump had set the stage for his loss on election night. This is a fraud on the American public. Influenced by an allegedly inebriated Rudy Giuliani, advising him to declare victory early over the objections of Trump's own campaign manager. I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Trump continued to peddle fraud right up to January 6th, inciting supporters who believed in the steal because he had told them. Big election. But if the election's being stolen, what is it going to take? You'll hear detailed testimony from the January 6th committee Barr. infers Trump deliberately conned supporters and tapped them for their money. The big lie was also a big ripoff. Susie, let's talk a little bit more about that, about what you just said there, about the big lie being the big ripoff. Yeah, essentially that Trump raised hundreds of millions of dollars off his supporters for a legal defense fund while he was being told there was no election fraud and much of that money was instead used for political purposes. And tonight, Adrian, Trump hit back. A 12-page response calling the hearings a smoke and mirrors show, a pitiful last-ditch effort to deceive the American public again, he said, and he refused to back off his debunked claims of election fraud. All right, Susan Ormiston in Washington, thank you. It was another difficult day on Wall Street, but this is about more than just an off day, off week, or off month. The U.S. stock market has crossed a line. Smiles aside, that is not a happy bell. At today's close, the S&P 500 is down more than 20% from its peak. By definition, that is a bear market. So here's every bear market for the S&P 500 since 1946. For most of them, once they dropped 20%, it was just the beginning. If markets run on emotion, for bear markets, the emotion is fear. Now, the TSX was down today, too. But unlike U.S. markets, it's down about 10% from its highs earlier in the year. Not technically a bear market. There is a reason for that. And we'll hear it from senior business correspondent Peter Armstrong. But first, Peter, why is all this happening now? Adrian, there's been a real shift in what's driving the economy. I mean, think back for the last, what, 12 years. The dominant force was cheap money sloshing around markets. And, and this sense that central banks were willing to jump in to prop up markets and economies when things did go a bit sideways. But... That's all changed. The dominant force now is inflation. It's driving up prices. It's eating into our purchasing power. And the response, well, higher interest rates, but that's going to slow the economy. It might even cause a recession. And this time, there's no cheap money. There's no stimulus waiting in the wings to bail us out of a potential crisis. Okay, so you said it. You said the R word, recession. You're not the only one to say it. How is Canada's economy actually doing, though? It, it's the envy of the world. Look, Canada had the best first quarter growth rate in the OECD. And a big part of that is surging energy prices, which benefit the Canadian economy. But here's the weird thing about inflation. It can change our behavior in a way that can amplify a potential downturn. That, you know, if you're feeling squeezed by rising prices or you're worried about a potential recession, you may not decide to buy that thing you've had your eye on. You may delay it. And enough people do that or they delay or cancel purchases. That in itself can end up slowing down the economy. And that is why central banks are just so keen to get inflation under control right now. All right, Peter Armstrong, senior business correspondent. Thank you. You bet. Now, the effect on cryptocurrencies has been dramatic. Bitcoin is down 20% since Friday. As Nisha Patel reports, investors who once saw it as an exciting space are fleeing. From movie stars... Fortune favors the brave. ...to social media... By the dip, guys, by the dip. Boom shakalaka. There's been no shortage of influencers pushing crypto, and investors have been buying it. These cryptocurrencies are still kind of an emerging market that, that people were, were trading when they were feeling good, when they were enthusiastic, when they were willing to take on risk. But as central banks started to raise interest rates, investors fled risky assets, prompting a crypto collapse. 
When markets are volatile, volatility goes both ways. Amid a backlog of trading orders, the largest crypto exchange, Binance, paused withdrawals briefly. Another, Celsius, froze withdrawals, meaning investors can't take out what's left of their money. According to Radio Canada, late last year, Quebec's pension plan invested 150 million U.S. dollars in Celsius. The group says it's monitoring the situation. Luca Rosenberg Lee started investing in crypto five years ago. It is a bit scary, obviously, to think of the coins that are supposed to be stable going up and down, but at the same time, it's crypto. You've got to be prepared to stomach the situation. The Bank of Canada says that from 2020 to 2021, the percentage of Canadians investing in Bitcoin rose from about 5 to 13. Policymakers recently issued this warning. Uh, we don't see uh, cryptocurrencies uh, um, as a way for Canadians to opt out of, out of inflation or as a, as a stable source of value. And though Canada has some robust regulations, experts say there's room for improvement. There needs to be maybe some heightened disclosures around conflicts of interest. Just one way to protect investors in a space that can come with great risk. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. Amnesty International is again accusing Russia of committing war crimes in Ukraine, dropping cluster bombs in Kharkiv, causing the deaths of hundreds of civilians. Taking care of all the casualties in eastern Ukraine is difficult and stressful work, as Margaret Evans found out, shadowing an emergency medic team. In wartime, there is also the waiting. The pauses, sometimes no less jangling, on already taut nerves. Skiff, the only name he wants to give, is a volunteer with a group of surgeons supporting Ukraine's frontline army medics. 90% of injuries, it's um, uh, artillery trauma. Uh, that's uh, legs, uh, hands, uh, uh, like that. Skiff is just one week into a four-week rotation. It's already telling. I want to forget. Uh, guys and soldiers who dies, because it's very sad, very difficult. We can't reveal anything about our location beyond that we're in the Donbass and close to a combat zone. That much is clear already in a nearby operating theater. Doctors fighting to save the arm and the life of a civilian hit by shrapnel in a nearby village. When the call comes for the mobile doctors, it happens in a heartbeat. The team is heading for an agreed evacuation point. Down empty roads, the threat of Russian drones overhead, a worry. They have to be prepared for anything from catastrophic injuries to concussions. Ukrainian doctors. On arrival, they can't leave the van without an all-clear from security. And the exchange takes place out of view. There are three more serious casualties in another ambulance, we're told, while Skiff's crew takes three walking wounded. We can't film the journey back, but they're taken for treatment at another hospital before the team returns to base. It wasn't as bad as they'd feared it might be. All three guys uh, bombing when they stand on positions, and uh, one guy have injured nose, uh, shrapnel. Uh, now they'll wait for the next call, and the call after that. Because our enemy very angry, big, and taste the blood. You know what happened with the animal who taste the blood. Margaret Evans, CBC News, in the Donbass. Pope Francis has cancelled an event next weekend due to persistent knee pain. The Pope has now delayed or cancelled several events this summer. The 85-year-old has been using a wheelchair for over a month due to strained ligaments. Pope Francis is scheduled to visit Canada and meet residential school survivors at the end of next month. The discovery of what is believed to be unmarked graves at many of those former residential schools has left Indigenous groups grappling with what to do next. 
Tonight, we'll take you to a reservation south of the border and the years-long fight to bring home the remains of their missing children. We wanted to bring them back and here they're protected forever. Plus, Calgary declares a state of emergency in the face of torrential rain as millions in the U.S. are hit with brutal heat. It's like an oven. I'm like so hot. And later, why your ground meat could soon come with a new warning. My initial reaction is it's ridiculous. We're back in two. That is a lot of rain, and Calgary declared a state of emergency today due to the heavy rains. While officials say major flooding is unlikely, they are still warning the public to be prepared. In some areas, up to 150 millimeters of rain is expected by Wednesday. And in the U.S., an early heat wave baked the southwest over the weekend. It blasted through many temperature records, and now it's slowly moving east. The heat hit the Midwest today with temperatures well into the 30s and 40s. More than 100 million Americans are affected from the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast. And it's set to keep marching eastward in the days ahead. Here's Belle Puri on how Americans are holding up or getting ready. Millions of Americans across dozens of states are feeling the heat. It's like an oven. I'm like so hot. I try not to go out because of the heat as well. It's predicted that by midweek, about 100 American cities could see record highs for this time of the year. Already, Las Vegas hit almost 43 degrees, Phoenix 45, Washington DC 33, and Philadelphia 35. Many cities are under excessive heat warnings. And with that heat and humidity come fears of health risks to the most vulnerable, to outdoor workers, and to those without access to air conditioning. For many, heat relief centers are the only option. We have seen a lot of heat exhaustion just come in and that's where the cots come involved that they could just rest and get um, rejuvenated and we monitor them as well. A half marathon in Brooklyn on Saturday saw a tragic illustration of the danger. One runner collapsed and died. 16 others were taken to hospital. The heat is a huge contrast from just three weeks ago when late in May, 50 centimeters of snow fell in Colorado. There you go, Corey. That same storm spawned tornadoes in Michigan and thunder on the eastern seaboard. Earlier than normal and prolonged heat waves are also a challenge for power supply. Columbia University climate change expert Romani Webb has a warning. Unless we really fundamentally rethink the way that we um, plan and design and operate our systems, um, it's going to be more rolling blackouts, longer lasting outages, um, and everybody's going to sort of feel more pain. Now more than 100 million Americans are under some form of heat warning or advisory. The historically high June temperatures show no sign of letting up. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. As Indigenous communities decide what to do with what's believed to be unmarked graves at former residential schools, tonight we visit a group in the U.S. that was able to bring home the remains of their missing children. I'm sure at the time not many people were thinking we should go get our relatives. You know, it's time to go get them. It's time to go back. Next, what they learned and the lessons they're sharing with communities here in Canada. Thousands of Indigenous children vanished at Canada's residential schools. They were taken and never returned. Their families left wondering what happened. It's been more than a year since as many as 215 suspected unmarked graves were discovered at the former Kamloops Residential School. Now the Tecumloops to Shwepmik First Nation is having conversations about if and how to begin the difficult task of exhuming the remains. And as Wamish Hamilton explains, there are lessons to be learned from other First Nations who've also brought home the remains of their missing children. It's a long way from Kamloops, BC to Mission, South Dakota in the United States. We're off to meet an Indigenous group that knows firsthand the pain Canada's Indigenous peoples are dealing with over missing children lost at Indian residential schools. Thank you. 
the Rosebud Sioux Indian tribe was able to bring home the bones of their ancestral children, kids from Sichungo lands who died more than a century ago while having the Indian taught out of them. You know, they were when they were taken, they were just children, and so um, we wanted to bring them back, and here they're protected forever. Jessica Two Eagles' relative has finally been laid to rest in the land where he always belonged. The Bedouin Cemetery was um, kind of the perfect place for some, and then of course some of the families wanted to bury them in their home cemeteries, so. Let's see who they were. There's flowers and even a toy. Mm-hmm. Warren Painter. Maud Little Girl. You know, we finally have our relative home who was sent off so long ago. The Carlisle Indian Industrial School opened in 1879 and operated for nearly 30 years with a mission to kill the Indian and save the man. This coercion for students to speak English, wear Anglo-American clothing, and act according to U.S. values and culture. Tuberculosis was also rampant during this time, and more than 180 students were buried at the Carlisle Indian School Cemetery. Wait for me, guys. Why isn't this child's actual name on this headstone? Sydney Horse Looking is now 23 years old. But back in 2015, she was a high school student learning about the Carlisle Indian Industrial Boarding School. She and other students visited the former boarding school site as part of their experiential learning. You know, why are they still there? And that question clicked in for a lot of people and it got them thinking because I'm sure at the time, not many people were thinking, we should go get our relatives. You know, it's time to go get them. It's time to go back. It took a group of children to motivate the Rosebud Sioux into action. There's been a lot of people who we've come across who came up to me personally and said, you know, why are you doing this? They're, they're dead. They're, they've been buried. They've been there for so long. Why are you doing this? Why now? Like, what's the big deal? What would follow was a six-year campaign to bring home the bones of their ancestral youth. Last summer, the first nine remains of Rosebud Sioux began the journey home from Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It was a four-day ritual that retraced the children's original journey to the boarding school from their homeland. Once there, the remains of three children went directly back to their families to be dealt with in their own traditional way. Warren Paint Dirt, Lucy Take the Tail, Rose Longface, Maud Little Girl, Alvin Kill Seven Horses, and Dennis Strikes First were buried in the Tribal Veteran Cemetery. Why was the Veteran Cemetery chosen for here? Because, you know, um, it's a well-kept area and as well as uh, we have our warriors here to protect them. Um, we felt like that was appropriate. One of the children's remains is related to Dwayne Hollow Hornbear's family. The idea of seeing his relative in a military cemetery, albeit a Sioux Veteran Cemetery, was in full closure for him. So it was incredibly important for him to do ceremony for his ancestor. When he was taken from here, he was not a U.S. citizen. But when he died out there, he was put into a military cemetery. And when they were bringing him home, the talk was, where are we going to put him? Duane never disclosed where he put friend Hollow Hornbear's remains. He simply went out into the land and provided his relative with what he felt was best for him. I'm going to set his spirit free. And so I dealt with it in my own way and spoke with him in prayer and heart and said, uh, you're home, you're home, rest here. And How does it feel to know he's home now? <laughs> I'm elated, I'm happy. You know, I'm at peace now. I'm at peace and that, that happiness that I've been t talking about, I'm looking for, I can feel it now. Families had closure. Um, a lot of relatives here that never spoke of their experiences in boarding school started to speak. Christopher Eagle Bear was another student on that fateful trip to Carlisle. 
Now 22, he offers what bringing home the children means to both the young ancestors and him. I felt like these spirits can finally stop crying, stop mourning, and may hopefully go see their families, and if not, come back around and be reborn into this world again, but live the life that they're supposed to live, you know, free and a child. Hey, come on, Spot. So what did we learn from the Rosebud Sioux? How is their struggle to repatriate the most vulnerable people in their history applicable to the Canadian context still unfolding? I really want to encourage the Canadian people to just to pay attention to the youth, you know, bring them to the next meeting, encourage them to pay attention. And if they are, then listen to see and hear what they have to say. Maybe they have good ideas that you haven't heard of yet. Learn your history and your own personal history, your family history that you can share and say, this is who this relative was and share it. Share it, don't be afraid to share it. I would just say, if you come across a descendant of somebody who's either, you know, who's been affected by boarding school, is just to give them a hug and let them know that it's okay. That this isn't a big secret no more. It's out, words out. In Canada, we will eventually run out of uncovering buried anomalies. So what's next? The Tequemlis to Shequetmik were the first to discover a pattern beneath the ground. They have also become the first to begin the process of revelation. Canadians and people around the world nervously await what they will find. And if they are the remains of children who were snatched from their parents and died far from home, we have the Rosebud Sioux to thank for showing us one possible way forward. I feel like it, it definitely um, opened the eyes like for the community and a lot of healing that still needs to be done um, that needs to take place. Well, Mish, there's a lot for people in Canada to learn about this experience of what to do with the children's remains. What did you find to be among the most striking lessons? The most striking lesson was to not underestimate youth. It was youth who started this. There was a group of youth from Sikandju who visited the White House for the Unity Conference in 2015. And on their return, they visited the Carlisle Industrial Boarding School, Indian Boarding School, where a lot of their kids had, had gone. And while there, they saw the graves of their peers while giving an offering of tobacco and candy. They asked a simple but profound question. Why aren't they home? Why has anybody come and got them? When they returned to Sikandju, they asked the same question of their travel officials. Why aren't they home? Why haven't you come and got them? That started the movement to repatriate, which resulted in last summer, the repatriation of nine children from Carlisle, which were brought back to Sikandju. Six are buried at the Veteran Cemetery. Three were given to their families of origin to bury. The lesson here is don't underestimate youth because look at what they accomplished there. All right, Wamish Hamilton in Vancouver, thank you. Thank you. The support is available for anyone affected by residential schools. You can access emotional and crisis referral services by calling the 24-hour National Crisis Line. That number, 1-866-925-4419. When we come back, why so many early childhood educators are leaving the industry. I think a lot of people say, oh, they're babysitters. We are much more than babysitters here. What this could mean for the promise of affordable daycare. And later, why Health Canada wants to add a new warning to some ground meat. Affordable daycare is not the done deal you may think it is. Not in Ontario. Yes, the province did eventually sign on to the federal program, but now child care providers are hesitating. Many say important program details just aren't clear. That complicates the promise of thousands of new spaces. And so does this, a stressed out workforce that's shrinking fast. Christine Birak shows us why early childhood educators are fed up and getting out. Eyes and ears on me, fingers on your lips. Let's go. I am Canada. I think if you went out today and you asked people, what does an early childhood educator do? Are you Canada? I'm Canada. I think a lot of people say, oh, they're babysitters. We are much more than babysitters here. Just say, stop, please. Stop, 
like we're not here to just change diapers and watch them play. We're supporting their social, emotional, physical development. Good job. Whoa. Prepping them for their next stages of life. Many parents across the country are desperate for child care spots that don't break the bank. The federal government is promising 250,000 spots over the next four years. But early childhood educators that care for these children, many of them have diplomas or degrees. Some make little more than minimum wage. The job is not easy and many are leaving the profession. You want to put this away for me too, please? It is primarily women doing this job. No wonder they're leaving. Thank you. It's no wonder they're leaving because we're undervalued, I think. And I think also that's also related to the pay that we get, right? And we feel like we're forgotten. What do I always tell you? Kind and gentle. Deanna Colella is a registered early childhood educator, or ECE, with a degree in psychology. That's the best that he can do. So you just, you can repeat and say, my name is Julian. Okay, let's go, let's eat. With another ECE, she manages up to 16 preschoolers, including two kids with special needs, here at this child care center in the heart of Toronto. I don't hear anybody saying thank you, Miss Deanna. Take my hand. You like that? Oh, nice. Ready? Let's make a stamp now. Ready? Things get messy, but she's teaching non-stop. Is that the world? You can sit there. You can smell the flowers. Use the magnifying glass. It may not look like it because all you see are toys and confusion, but there's a lot of learning happening here. We do maths with them. We do science with them. I'm starting geography with them. There's no time limit to teach them. Yeah. You know what? You can put them in the bin. We'll look that's in the bin. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's I part told of the you, job. I told you this no. is what's going to happen. This is the ultimate in multitasking. Right? Uh, squish it up, my baby. Bumblebee. Won't my mommy be so proud All that learning matters. Research shows children who attend early childhood education programs are less likely to need special education classes or be held back a grade, and they're more likely to graduate from high school. We are professionals, you know, we have studied child development. We know the different stages, so we also know red flags, we know what to look for. We're always observing them, we're always listening to them. That's exactly why Lily Desda's son is here. Nyhair has Down syndrome. As a parent's perspective, I'm just giving love. For them, is they're actually focusing on his needs. Show me how you wash your hands. His mental okay. progress and everything. So I really need them. Oh, I missed. Did you get it? Lily says Nyhair's motor and social skills have come a long way here. And that means everything. If teachers, they do honestly deserve a lot more than what they're getting right now. That high quality of care is in demand, but like many child care centers across the country, spots are limited. It's about this thick. The wait list the wait. is about this thick. Yep, yep. Eva Laxon manages 10 nonprofit child care centers across Toronto, including this one. She says staff are leaving because the pandemic has exhausted them. And she isn't sure $18 an hour to start will attract the tens of thousands of new educators needed for $10 a day care. Do you think we're going to get there? I don't think so. I don't. We're trying to hire supply staff. Like, it's, it's, it's hard. I think just the stresses of this job and, you know, the responsibilities, I think people just recognize that maybe it's just not enough for what they're going to pay. Yeah. ECE Kelly Galland says no, exactly. if not for her right, partner, living in Toronto door, would be impossible. Then... I would say it's almost insulting that we're expected to do the work that we do and receive the payments that we receive. With the education and the training that we go through on an annual basis, we do professional development courses three times a year at least. Is this something you would recommend people get into? Emotionally, yes, I would recommend it because I know the benefits that it has on me and the positive impact it's had in my life. But realistically, is it live, like doable, manageable, livable? No, it's not. For parents, that's tough to hear.
I admire them so much. I know it's a very hard uh, job to do. I, I couldn't imagine myself doing it. It kind of breaks my heart to hear that they're feeling compelled to leave the profession. I think that most people are probably on board with their daycare providers getting paid better. I think there's a, there's a way to find a solution. We'll have to figure it out. Time to sleep. Figuring it out could include paying college tuition for ECEs, benefits, sick pay, and paid preparation time, in addition to wage increases. You guys are doing a great job. Look at everybody. But maybe more than anything, it's about respecting and supporting the early childhood educators that care for our children. Good night, everybody. Good night. Christine Virac, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah, time to sleep. Amazing people. Your ground beef and pork could soon come with a new warning label. My initial reaction is it's ridiculous. And the reason being is, at what point in time, where does this stop? Why Health Canada wants to make some changes at the butcher counter. Next. Health Canada could very well have a food fight on its hands. It wants to put warning labels on some groceries that are high in sugar, salt, and saturated fats. Under the plan, ground beef could get a sticker, but not eggs or milk. And as Aaron Collins explains, now Alberta is pushing back. Customers have been lining up at this Calgary butcher shop for more than a century. And just as it always has been, ground beef and pork are big sellers. But unless that ground meat is extra lean, it could soon come with a warning label. My initial reaction is it's ridiculous, and the reason being is, at what point in time, where does this stop? Confusion about why ground beef and pork were targeted and concern about what else might need a label down the road. Does that mean now we're going to have to do it on sausages, we're going to have to do it on pork, we're going to have to do it on hamburger patties, we're going to have to do it on absolutely everything? I mean, there's going to be a saturated fat in whatever you're going to eat. Like, just, do we have to do it on steaks too? Like, where does this go? Steaks and other whole cuts of meat would be exempt, but sausages may need a sticker. Warning labels would also be applied to food high in sugar and salt as well as saturated fat. But ranchers and their supporters feel singled out. They want an exemption to the front of package labeling like the one given to dairy products. Labeling ground beef, an affordable, nutritious and versatile protein and a staple food for most Canadians is misleading and does not make sense to us. Bad for the industry and bad for provinces like Alberta. This restrictive labeling proposal for ground meat could have significant market consequences for Alberta producers, increasing production costs, lowering consumer purchases and decreasing exports. And if Canadians turn away from ground beef and pork, it could also hurt many families' bottom line. Essentially, you're going to see uh, a federal agency discouraging Canadians from eating what is arguably probably the cheapest and more, most affordable animal protein there is right now at the meat counter. No word yet on when customers might actually see the new labels, but little concern here that a sticker will curb Canadians' taste for beef. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. When we come back, a trip to the movies in Montreal. And that's how you open a bag. Indeed, we will meet the man behind a local cinema that's a local favorite. Next. That proud man is Bernie Gerber. He has owned the Dollar Cinema in Montreal for 18 years. But think of the effect of streaming services and COVID lockdowns. It's a lot. So Bernie had to make the hard call to close. So the thing is, the experience at Dollar Cinema was never just about a good film. It was about Bernie treating his customers fairly, kindly, the price of admission and concessions always cheap. So tonight, some thoughts for the Dollar Cinema and its owner in our moment. I think he's amazing. I've been going here since I was like not even born. Like when my mom was pregnant, she would bring me here. It's really sad. There's so many memories here. So I, I said I could do budget, family-oriented type of stuff, which is, was my first idea, and it worked. People really started coming quite a lot. Everybody was happy. I've been coming here uh, the last 15 years. Uh, every Saturday I work with special needs, and they enjoy coming here. 
think Bernie treated us like family. And that's how you open a bag. I want to thank our customers who've been coming here and uh, interacting with me. Always good people. That was a nice thing, the, the experience of having all these friends. And the thank you goes out to you, Bernie. Uh, Sarah, who worked uh, on this for us, tells us that, you know, she made a good observation that Bernie has been really a hero to a lot of hardworking people who needed a break. Prices often a buck for a film, never more than 250. That is rare, and that is a national for June 13th. Thank you.